as well. So we're in the middle of a series called um, Rooted, um, Growing in Our Faith. Um, and our desire in this series is we want to um, see you grow in your walk with Jesus. Um, mentioned before, but the number one question that I was getting over the last several months was, how, how do you grow? How am I doing the right things? Am I growing? How do I know that I'm growing? And so we've designed this topical series, um, and we're going through various books of the Bible, various chapters, and just looking at what does it mean to grow? How do you know you're growing? And some of the basic things that we're supposed to be doing so that we can grow. Um, a couple weeks ago, um, probably a little bit longer than that, um, the check engine sign came on on my car. And I'll acknowledge to you that it's probably been about a month, and I still haven't gone to figure out what that is. My car still runs, so I'm pretty content. And I have no idea what the light means, but, um, and if you're going to come to me afterwards and say, hey, that's bad, listen, I already have a wife to tell me that, right? Um, I don't need you to tell me. Um, she's probably told me like every day for the last three weeks. Um, um, I love learning details about stuff like how car works, but sometimes I don't need to know all the details. I just need to know someone that knows that. And then I can find out the information I need, find out how much it's going to cost me, and know what I need to do next. I just need to know the basics. And our walk with Jesus, our growth with Jesus is like that. I love studying theology and picking apart the intricacies of what happens as we grow. But my goal this morning is really to give you the basics. And we're going to do this over the next couple of weeks. The three basic things that help us form the basis of our growth as we apply the gospel to our lives. No matter how much we grow, we're always building on these basics. Spiritual growth isn't complicated. It's pretty simple. And one of the reasons we're doing this series, even right now, is because my fear that some of you and some of us are kind of stuck in our walk with Jesus. We're, you're not turning into an atheist over your, overnight. You're not denying your faith. You're not thinking about leaving the church, but you're not going anywhere spiritually. You're spiritually just stagnant. Um, your Christian life has become routine. You aren't growing at all. And if this, describes you, if this describes you in any way, my prayer is that as we do this series, that it will motivate you to pursue Jesus, and that pursuit really would be rich, and that it would be transforming. As I was thinking about the sermon for this week, I sensed the Lord was taking us to a passage that challenges us, challenges us to pray to grow in every dimension of our faith. If you have your Bibles, Ephesians three is where we're going to be. And this is a prayer that pr Paul prays. In Ephesians three fourteen down to verse 21, let me read this. Um, Ephesians three fourteen to 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family on heaven, in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him, who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think. According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is one of my favorite passages and prayers in Scripture. It's a prayer that I have prayed numerous times over myself, over my family, in fact, over you guys, over this church. If you're a football fan, um, when a team desperately needs to throw a touchdown to score to win, the quarterback will sometimes throw what they call a Hail Mary. It's a pass that they throw all the way down the field that if, if caught will result in a touchdown, if caught possibly will win the game for their team. And Paul's prayer here is a Hail Mary. That, but it's even greater than that. He prays that these believers will be filled with the fullness of God. Then, 
as if that was beyond all limits. He prays in verse 20 that he, that to him who is able to do more abundantly than we can ask or think. I think God's power is the limit on what we can pray. James 4, we looked at this when we were doing our series on James, say that we often have not because we ask not. So don't be guilty this morning of not asking God to do what which is humanly impossible. And through this text, let me just give you just a few words of encouragement as you read this prayer, and in fact, as you pray this prayer over your own life. Number one, pray this prayer often over yourself. Pray this prayer over your family. Pray this prayer over the people of God that God has brought into your life. Notice a few things about this prayer. Number one, pray more for spiritual growth than for your physical or material things. Paul was writing this letter sitting in a prison. And prisons in that day were not like prisons today. They didn't have three meals a day. They didn't have someone that was just um, advocate for them, a lawyer. They were getting beaten often. They were often being abused. They were often getting neglected in terms of food and their basic necessities. And he's getting old and age, and his physical body was worn out. Probably had a lot of aches and pains. And if I was in that circumstances, I would probably be praying, God, give me another meal. God, would you take these scars away that are abusing me? God, would you strengthen my body? God, heal my body. But Paul doesn't pray any of those things where he's at. Paul begins, he says, for this reason. And I don't have time to go through the first three chapters of Ephesians, but to summarize, Paul is saying, because God has saved you by his amazing grace, because God has made you Jews and Gentiles as one people, because you are being built together as the church, because God is doing something in you, because of that I pray. And what he prays is that God would make real in their experience what is true to them positionally in Jesus. In other words, he prays more for their spiritual growth than for their physical or material growth. Pray also in humble submission and dependence. Paul directs his prayer to the Father. He could have said, hey, this is what I'm going to pray, but he says, I bow my knees before the Father. That kneeling means reverence, submission, humility, adoration before God. It implies the intimacy of a child that comes to the Father knowing the child is going to be welcome into the Father's lap any time because that's his child. Paul says, pray like that, knowing that you can have access to the Father anytime you want, knowing that you can go to the King of Kings and knowing that he will welcome you in and he will put you on his lap and he will listen to what you're praying. Know that you are a child of God. Paul also prays based on God's grace, not on his performance. In verse 16, it says, grant, grant me. Grant means to give freely. We receive all of God's riches. Why? Because of God's grace, his unmerited favor. And while we must confess and forsake all sins, if we want God to hear our prayers, we don't approach his throne on the basis of what we've done or how well we performed. We come to him as unworthy sinners, but through the merit of our high priest, Jesus, who invites us to receive mercy, to find grace for help in time of need. Something else I want you to notice, Paul prays in faith, knowing that God's supply is limitless. Paul prays in verse 16 that the Father would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Paul knows that God owns the world and everything in it. But Paul has in mind not so much material riches, but spiritual riches that God freely gives to us in Jesus And he begins Ephesians, in Ephesians 1, he says, Blessed be God through Jesus, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And he goes on to say in Ephesians 2, that in the ages to come, that he would show us the sort of passing riches of kindness and grace that's shown to us in Jesus. Paul prays in faith, knowing that God's supply is limitless. Second thing I want you to notice is pray for God to grant you, to grant that you will be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner person. Verse 16 says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Why do you pray that? One, you're praying that for the power of the indwelling spirit because your problems 
are beyond your strength to resolve. This is not a dramatic one-time experience, but rather an ongoing experience of God's power to change our hearts as we walk in the Spirit every single day. As Jesus said in John 15, he said, listen, apart from me, you can't do anything. We are totally dependent on Jesus for our lives, and yet often we forget this. And the reason I know we forget this is because we don't pray enough. We think we do it by ourselves. And because of our prayerlessness, we basically acknowledge, God, I just need you there on standby. When I'm in trouble, you can come and help me. But really, I got this on my own. A prayerful person is one that acknowledges, God, if you're not there, I'm just going to screw this whole thing up. I'm going to mess it up really bad. I need to be dependent on you. Our prayerlessness acknowledges our dependency on Jesus. We're totally dependent on him. And you're praying for power through his spirit in the, pers- in the inner person because God changes outward behavior by changing the heart first. We talked about this quite a bit last week. Modern science has made some amazing discoveries, but it hasn't discovered how to impart life to a dead animal or a dead person. But Jesus has through the cross. Because he died and resurrected, he says, your dead heart I can make alive. He knows that those who are dead in their sins now have life through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we pray not just for outward appearance and outward changes, but we pray, pray for an inward transformation for ourselves and for others, not just outward behavior changes. Many Christians think that just because someone does good things on the outside that they're great, but God says, I don't look at the outside. I look at the heart. The question is, did God change your heart? Is God changing your heart? Are your desires for Jesus? Are your passions for him? Are you wanting to serve him? Do you hunger, thirst for God? Listen, the battle against temptation, the battle against sin is a battle that is going to be won or lost in your heart. It's going to be won or lost in your inner person. You may be able to change outward behavior through techniques or methods or behavior modification, but if God doesn't change your heart, all you're doing is you're putting a tuxedo on a pig. And that pig is going to go run right back into the mud as quickly as possible. Jesus said this about the Pharisees. He says, you Pharisees, you look really, really good on the outside. Everyone looks at you and you are praying and you're going to the synagogue and you're giving and you look wonderful, but your hearts, it's a mess. Your hearts, it's not pursuing me at all. And listen, we have to be careful of judging people based on how they perform on the outside. We have to be careful even of ourselves of judging ourselves based on how well we perform just because we go to church every week or we read the Bible or we pray and do all of our religious duties, but our heart isn't right. We need to be careful of that. Jesus is more passionate about your heart being transformed, that you're loving and pursuing Jesus more than anything else. Genuine Christianity is not just a moral improvement program. We need changed hearts, and it begins at new birth, and it continues your entire life. And for that kind of inward change, we need nothing less than the power of the Holy Spirit. Only He can make the kind of heart change where Jesus is pleased to dwell in you. And as you ask God to strengthen you with power, it's for three things, so that you can know Him, you can worship Him, and you can obey him. These are the three things that we'll be looking at over the next several weeks. But let me just quickly introduce them to you today. The basics of our faith is that we would know, that we would worship, and we would obey. A few years ago, I went to India um, to preach, to teach at this Bible college. And there were just students from all over India that were coming and studying. And as soon as they were done, they were going to hard parts of the nation to go plant churches. And so I had an opportunity to spend a week to teach them. And in between the classes, the students would often play this game called cricket. And um, cricket is this incredibly popular game in India. Now, I know nothing about cricket, right? Um, so I'm sitting there watching them play, and I'm like, oh, this is baseball. That's all it is. And so I'm like, I can play this, cricket, the 
There's a bat, there's a ball, there's a pitcher, there's a catcher. Um, it's the Indian version of baseball. It's not that hard. I know baseball. And these guys wanted me to play. And so I was like, all right, I can play this. I got this, right? And so and they stood there and they explained the rules to me. And I'm not listening. Because in my mind, all I have to do is stand up there, take the bat, hit the ball as far as possible. And so I, they want me to bat first. So I get up there, I get ready, I'm ready to swing. The guy pitches and it bounces. And I'm like, oh, that's a horrible pitch. I'm not hitting this, but it bounces and it hits these little poles that are behind me. Um, and all of a sudden, everyone is cheering. And I'm like, this is weird. These guys are cheering because I got strike one. And what I didn't realize is if it hits the pole, I'm out of the game completely. Because I didn't pay attention to the rules, after one pitch, I had to sit on the sidelines and watch the entire game. Now, it might be bad experience, but I think cricket is a horrible sport, right? Um, and so, uh, but knowing helps you get better. Paying attention and listening and knowing God makes you stronger in your walk with Jesus. Listen, it is impossible to understand and enjoy life the way God designed it until you understand the most important things about God, who he is, how he's revealed himself to us, and how this world should work. This knowledge is intellectual. It involves learning about God, but it's also deeply personal. It involves getting to know God in a relationship. And we're not just learning a set of facts. I'm not interested in you just knowing church history or church doctrine. We're getting to know God, and we're getting to know a person in a relationship. God is concerned that we know him. A.W. Tozer was right when he said, what comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. J.I. Packer goes even further in his book, Knowing God. He said, knowing about God is crucially important for the living of our lives. It would be absolutely cruel to take an Amazon tribesman fly him to London, put him in the middle of the city, and leave him as one who knows nothing about English and their culture, and for he has to fend himself. And in the same way, it would be cruel for us to live in this world without knowing about the God whose world it is and who runs this world. The world becomes a strange, mad, painful place, and life in it will become disappointing and unpleasant for those who don't know about God. Disregard the study of God, and you sentence yourself to stumble and blunder around life blindfolded with no sense of direction, no understanding of what surrounds you. This is the way you waste your life and you lose your soul. Friends, the Bible is clear about this. Jesus prayed in John 17. He said, sanctify them in truth. Through your word is truth. In Psalm 119, it says, I've stored up your word in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against you. So we must learn about God. We must get to know his nature, who he is, how he acts, what he's done. And this isn't important just for scholars or pastors or theologians and the intellectual types. In fact, we're all theologians. We all do theology every day. We all make decisions every single day based on what we believe is true. Theology matters because if we get theology wrong, then our whole life is wrong. The basis of your decision is the basis of your relationship with Jesus. So you need to know God. You must learn what he's taught about us of how to live in this world. The Bible is full of practical advice of how to think, how to live. It teaches us about wisdom, the skill of living wisely in this world, in the world that God has created. It would do us well if we pay attention to what he says. And as we get to know God in the Bible, we learn what he wants from us in the practical details of our lives and how we work and how we play and how we love and how we rest and how we take care of our family and so much more. We learn what the Bible calls wisdom, the skill of living. So how do we get to know him? We read what he's taught us. We read, we listen to, we study the Bible. The practice has more significant impact on your overall growth than any other practice. And sadly, there are studies that show that many of us aren't reading scriptures regularly. Listen, friends, if you want to grow in your walk with Jesus, it's going to take a lot more than simply asking some friends to pray for you. You have to be intentional about diving into God's word. Yes, 
Sometimes it's boring. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't make sense. But listen, this is God's holy word for you. And if you want to be what God has called you to be, you've got to dive into it. I've shared the story before, the story of Max Locato teaching his daughter how to play piano. He's writing a book, and his daughter is in the other room um, practicing her piano, and she doesn't want to play. She hates it, but he makes her play. Why? Because he's a mean dad? No. He makes her play because he knows that the more she practices, the better she gets. Even though she hates it, even though it's not enjoyable, even though some days it seems routine, even though some days it's incredibly boring, she sits there and she practices and she plays. Listen, if you want to grow and mature in your walk with Jesus, some days you just have to just sit and push through and work and just say, God, I don't feel anything today, but I know that I'm reading your word and you can transform my life. You can change me. You can help me grow. I'm just going to keep pushing in. You've got to be intentional about it. You got to know him. Second, you got to worship him. Listen, it's not enough to just know God. You must also worship God. To worship means to attribute worth and to hold him as valuable in our lives, of more value than anyone or anything else. It's the first of the Ten Commandments, right? You shall, love, you shall have no other gods beside me. Jesus reemphasized the importance of worship when he answered a question about the great commandment. He said, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. We need to know about God, but we need to know, do more. We need to worship him in his glory. Just as like we're all theologians, we're also all worshipers. We all worship something. The thing that you are most passionate about, the thing that you want to talk about the most in your life, that's what you're passionate about. That's what you worship. And what we value most is what we become. Listen, all of God is a powerful thing. To worship means to engage our hearts. We go beyond knowing about God to now knowing God. Worship moves us from doctrine to devotion. One of my favorite hymns is a song called When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. The first verse of that song leads us to the cross. It goes beyond understanding to really taking it in. And if you know the song, it says, When I survey, survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died. And Isaac Watts, the writer of the songs, helps us visualize Jesus' sacrificial death for us. Sorrow and love flowing from his hands, his head, his feet, the thorns on his head, a rich crown. And then the author begins to describe the effects of his life as he wanders on the cross. He says he counts his richest gain, his most valuable possession, as his loss. He says he pours contempt on all his pride. He says he sacrifices the things that charm him most for Jesus. He says he surrenders his soul, his life, his all. Isaac Watts discovered a powerful tool to change. He said, when you treasure God's glory that's manifested through the lens of what Jesus did for us on the cross, you begin to change. Become consumed with the vision of God and his beauty. Meditate on his holiness and his grace. Look at the cross. Consider what this means for your life now. Friends, you are accepted. You are delivered. You are not alone, and you have authority. Keep beholding Jesus, and friends, it will change you. It will transform you. The only way to move from one affection to another is to replace, and the only way to get out of one addiction is to replace it with an affection for something else. The only way you're going to get out of sin and things that you're struggling with is to get an affection for something even greater than what you're beholding right now. And listen, something greater is Jesus. Value him. Treasure him. Worship him. You change as you behold and cherish God's beauty and God's holiness. And Paul encourages us to behold Christ, the things of Christ, to set our minds on him. And he goes further. He says he wants us to seek him and pursue them. The pursuit of God begins to change our desires. And change in our desires begins to change in our desires begin to change our behaviors. Knowing and worshiping God are powerful forces for change in our life. In fact, growth isn't possible without them. 
But listen, they're incomplete without obedience. When we get to know God, when we get to worship God, when we get to see Jesus for who he is, you want to obey him. You want to follow him. When you recognize that he lived the life that you should have lived, died the death that you should have died, that he was your substitute, he didn't deserve the cross, you and I did, but he took our place and that he is in passionately in love with you and he cares for you and he desires you and he wants he wants to be engaged and involved in your life when that begins to grip your heart it leads to a life of obedience you're not obeying so that God will accept you you're obeying because God has accepted you because God has look God does look down on you and say that's my son that's my daughter I'm going to just lavish my love on them Listen, there's nothing you can do today to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do today to make God love you less. He loves you. And you need to let that sink into your heart and let that flow, let that become a lifestyle of obedience. And obedience involves two activities. One, it causes you to turn away from sin. And two, it causes you to engage in activities that help you grow. Negatively, we obey by avoiding sin. And you guys know the list of sins that are in Scripture. There's numerous passages that are there that Paul talks about or Jesus talks about or even the Old Testament writers talks about things that we need to turn away from. And listen, their assumption in Scripture is that we can avoid them, that you don't have to be addicted to them. He, and Paul is saying, listen, if the power of Jesus is in you, greater is he that's in you than who that's in the world. If you have Jesus in you, you don't need to be addicted to whatever you're addicted to. You can overcome. He gives you the ability to see sin for what it is and avoid it. Yeah, we don't always succeed, but we can learn to avoid sin more and more as we depend on God. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, sin should not have mastery over your life. You'll still feel its influence. You'll still feel tempted to it, but it no longer should control you like it used to. Our job is to do what God is already doing within us to kill sin. We need to be killing it. Positively, we obey God by keeping his commands. And Jesus connects obedience to love. John 14, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Before, we were powerless to obey. Once God began to change us, we not only want to obey God out of love, but we're, now we're able to obey God out of love. And as we read commands in the Bible, we will increasingly find that we're able to obey where we once struggled, not, because, not only because we know and love God, but because he is at work in us giving us the power to obey. And we're going to dive deeper into each of these things over the next several weeks. So let's just look at the prayer of Paul just for a few more seconds. Number three, pray that Christ will dwell in your heart through faith. Friends, biblical faith is not passive. It's not where you just let go and let God and God just does whatever. Rather, it's an active reliance on God and his promises often in the face of impossible circumstances. Biblical faith is always linked with obedience. If you trust God, you obey God. To obey God, you must trust that his word is true. Christ dwelling in your heart means that he progressively takes over er every area of your life. This is a lifelong process where you welcome God into every aspect of your life so that there is no known area where you would be uncomfortable having Jesus reside in. Years ago, InterVarsity Press put out this little booklet by Robert Munger called My Heart, Christ's Home. And Munger writes about how after Christ entered his heart, in the joy of that newfound relationship, he said, Lord, I want this heart of mine to be yours. I want you to settle down here and be perfectly at home. Everything I have is yours. Every room is yours. Let me show you around and introduce you to the various features of this home so that you can grow comfortable and we can have fellowship together. And so he took Jesus into his study. 
which represented what his mind focused on. And the Lord had some cleaning up there to do. And from there, they went to the living room where they agreed that they would meet together every morning to start the day together. And that went well for a while. But then Munger says he got busy and started skipping those times. He had viewed those quiet times as only a means for his own spiritual progress rather than fellowship with Jesus. And they began to move from one room to the next, remodeling, cleaning, sometimes just ripping rooms apart wherever necessary. And the final room was a closet down the hall that Munger had a lock on. It was where he kept his secrets that he didn't want Jesus to know about. And he finally had to give Jesus a key so that he could clean out that closet. Friends, this is how God works in our hearts. He wants to move from room to room until every area of our life is suitable to be the dwelling place of Jesus. He does this as we trust and as we obey him. Fourth thing I want you to notice, pray that you will be rooted and grounded in love. Verse 17 says that you being rooted and grounded in love. The result of that you being strengthened in power through God's Spirit is that you are rooted and grounded in love. And he's saying that love is the main principle of the Christian life. God's great love for us demonstrated to us by sending his Son to be the sacrifice for us undergirds everything that we do. All of the commandments of Jesus are summed up in two, right? Love the Lord with all your heart. Love one another. The Christian life has to be rooted and grounded in love. So pray that you would sink down roots in God's love as seen at the cross. Pray that his great love in sending his son to die for your sins would be the foundation for everything in your life, both Godward and toward others. Number five, pray that you will be able to comprehend the extent of the love of Jesus that goes beyond our understanding. Verse 18, verse 19, you'll be able to understand with the saints what is the width, the length, the height, the depth, to know the love that surpasses knowledge. May be able to, to have strength, to comprehend. Those means to lay hold, to cease. Every child of God knows the love of Jesus in one extent or another, but this verse states that you can never know it fully because it's beyond human comprehension. Paul wants you to take the immeasurable love of Jesus and take it to a deeper level. Paul wants you to experience the limitless love of Jesus. No, you will not get to know this unknowable love by yourself. There's a corporate emphasis in that verse there. Verse 15 talks about he knows every family in heaven, every family in heaven on earth. It probably should translate the whole family, referring to the church. In Ephesians, Paul is talking about the church being built together as a dwelling place of God. And in verse 18, he prays that we together will be able to comprehend the magnitude of the love of Jesus for his saints. And then in the doxology, he prays that there will be glory to God in the church and in Jesus Listen, I've experienced God's love in many, many ways in my life. And if I sit and talk with you, I will know, I will hear how you have experienced God's love in your life. And that experience will be multiplied when we sit together in bigger groups and each of us share our stories of what God has done in each of our lives and that extend that locally and globally. God has done an incredible work in each of our lives. So when you get together with other believers... Share your story. Talk about what Jesus has done in you so that we can pull, if we pulled all the stories of believers worldwide together, we still wouldn't be able to know the width and the length and the height and the depth of God's love. It surpasses knowledge. Friends, I have blind spots in my life. You've got blind spots in your life. When I read the Bible, when I read the Bible, I tend to read it as if God is only talking to me. You're the salt of the world, it's just me. Jesus says, says, I think that he's only talking about me, at least as an individual. Put on the whole armor of God, he think he's talking about me, but I picture myself standing alone with everything there, and there's no one around me. But that's not scripture. It's all of us together putting on the armor of God. It's all of us together 
being the salt and light of the world. We are supposed to do it together. More often, we can read these verses as saying, y'all are the salt of the earth. Y'all need to put on the armor of God, not you. The Christian life doesn't make sense when lived alone. By the way, I never would have said y'all um, in my life till I moved down here. We're meant to live in community with others. We need others to grow. And Scripture reflects what the admonition is to love one another, to honor one another, to accept one another, to serve one another, to carry one another's burdens, to be kind to one another, to be compassionate to one another, to submit to one another, admonish one another, encourage one another, confess our sins to one another. This is not something we do by ourselves. An African proverb says, if you want to go quickly, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Friends, my prayer is that we would go far in our walk with Jesus. That we would mature in our walk with Jesus. That we would be what Jesus calls us to be. We can try and grow by ourselves. It's messy trying to grow with other people. Sometimes it feels like other people hold us back. But listen, other people aren't holding you back. They're just, God is using them to strengthen your faith so that you could be what God's called you to be. Don't neglect community. Don't try to do this by yourself. You need each other. All right, a couple more. Pray that you'll be filled to the fullness of God. This is the summit of the prayer. This is the top of Mount Everest here, that you will be filled to the fullness of God. It's very comparable to Paul's prayer in Colossians. He says that that you would be complete in Jesus. The perfection of God would be made in you. It's a prayer that God would totally fill you and control every aspect of your life, your attitudes, your goals, your motives, your emotions, your relationships, your finances. Every decision you make would be one that you first would go and say, Jesus, what do you want me to do? That's what he's praying here. It's comparable to Paul's goal in Ephesians 4 that we would attain the unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God to be a mature man that brings honor to Jesus. It basically means, to quote the army, to be all that God wants you to be. Be spiritually mature. As with this prayer, it's a process that will never be complete in this life. I said last week, I've never met a person who said, or thought that they were mature in their walk with Jesus. We're all, always maturing. We're always growing. But it's God's desire that every believer be conformed to the image of his son. And last thing. Pray for God to do far more abundantly beyond all that you can ask or think. Verse twenty twenty one. Pray big prayers for God to do what is humanly inexplainable. Can I invite you? Can I encourage you? Don't pray small, safe prayers. As I said earlier, this is a Hail Mary prayer. You're going for broke, asking God for things that are way beyond human ability. If you feel like you can never grow or mature in your faith, can I invite you? Pray, God, make me grow. God, mature me. God, make me into what you called me to be. Pray the largest prayer you can pray. For those people in your life that you think will never come to Jesus, but God has brought you into their lives, pray that you would see a day where they are worshiping Jesus. Pray because you're not doing it. God is able to do it. Pray large prayers. Pray prayers over your kids that your kids will grow to love Jesus, follow Jesus, pursue Jesus even better than you do. Pray for things that you know that you can't do by yourself. That's what Jesus is inviting us to do in this prayer. You can't pray a prayer so large for God. Someone once said, pray not for crutches, but pray for wings. Pray that you would soar to be everything God has called you to be. But one caution. Sometimes for reasons we can't understand, God doesn't answer the prayers we pray for the way that we had hoped for. Is that me? Paul prayed fervently for the conversion of the Jews. But many of them never came to Jesus. On a positive side, and some of you can attest to this, I know I can, that there are many, many prayers I've prayed 
in my walk with Jesus that now looking back, I'm just like, God, thank you so much for not answering that prayer, right? I mean, there are women in my life that are like, God, I want to marry her one day, make that happen. And now I'm like, God, thank you so much that didn't happen. <laughs> there are requests I've made, and then I look back and say, God, thank you so much that didn't happen. And so sometimes we've got to be able to say, man, God, I can pray and I can cast my request before you, but I know that you know better. And so it's not what I want, it's what you want. Um, and just trust that if God doesn't answer the prayer, it's because he knows what's best, right? But on a negative side, there are people I've prayed would come to know and love Jesus that have died without knowing and loving Jesus. There are friends I prayed for for healing that were never healed in their physical bodies. There are broken relationships I prayed for to be restored that have never happened. So there is this mystery about prayer that we can't always understand God's ways, but yet he still calls us to pray the largest prayers that we could pray. And more than anything, Paul is teaching us in this letter, pray that God would be glorified. You can pray for all the material blessings in your life, but Paul is saying, God, at the end of the day, regardless of what you give me or don't give me, regardless of where you take me or don't take me, regardless of what I have or don't have, at the end of the day, would Jesus just be glorified through my life? Would, would when people see me, would they, would they just see that there's something different about me because of the way I love, because of the way I care, because they see Jesus in me? That's what Paul's saying. More than anything else, more than any other desire you have, the greatest prayer that you could have is to pray that you would live your life in such a way that in the day that you stand before Jesus, he would look at you and he would smile and he'll say, well done. Well done. That is what Jesus is inviting us to, to live our lives with radical faith of saying, God, this life is not my own, but at the cross, you have ransomed it. It now belongs to you. Now, would you be glorified through this body? I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. To pray this prayer often for yourself. Pray it over your family. Pray it over the people that God has brought into your life. Pray that the God would grant you power through his spirit. Pray that Christ would dwell in your heart through faith and that you will be rooted and grounded in love. That you will be able to comprehend the immeasurable extent of the love of Jesus and that you would be filled with the fullness of God. And would you pray that God to do far more abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think. For his glory, his glory alone.